Why don't we, uh, as we traditionally do, take just a moment to prepare our hearts uh, for the word, uh, take any unconfessed sin, lay it before God, ask forgiveness, and claim the promise of 1 John 1, 9. And then we will get started uh, predominantly in Judges 3, chapter 3 today. Just take a moment. Most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given your word uh, to us that uh, it might be an example uh, for us to follow uh, a light unto our feet, a pathway to assist us in uh, accepting your invitation to work on behalf of your kingdom uh, here on earth that others might come to know your son uh, who you graciously gave as a sacrifice for our sins. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. In business, there is a um, term called M and A. Do you know what the term M and A means? Mergers and acquisitions. Um, what's that? You've been through it many times. Well, then, then this will this will resonate with you potentially, because so have I. Um, now. When I was doing my executive MBA at, at the Neely School at TCU, uh, the, um, uh, the capstone professor, and that's the one that teaches the first course of the sequence and then the last course of the sequence, uh, was a um, uh, professor of management but had had experience with uh, First Union and Bank of America. And if you know anything about the financial industry, you know about mergers and acquisitions. And right now, if you know anything about the healthcare a field you also know about mergers and acquisitions, oil and gas, mergers and acquisitions, mergers and acquisitions everywhere. But something he said really stuck with me. He said, we call it mergers and acquisitions, but there's really no such thing as a merger. It's all acquisition. Uh, it just kind of sounds nice to be able to say mergers and acquisitions. So as we still look at the, um, the state of the Israelite people, uh, who um, were supposed to acquire uh, the land that was already given the, to them by God, instead attempted to merge and synchronize with um, the Canaanite people. I, I think there's some interesting parallels. Now, I, came, I come from a, a pharmaceutical background of fairly intense mergers and acquisitions. I started out at a company called Gideon Daniel Searle, the Searle Company. We were based in Skokie originally, uh, this company was based in Omaha, Nebraska. One of our CEOs that preceded uh, my arrival there was a fellow named Don Rumsfeld, uh, who uh, some of you may uh, have uh, recognized as a uh, former um, um, defense secretary uh, for uh, the United States. Uh, but um, we were known for quite a few things. Uh, you can thank me for them later, even though I had nothing to do with them, uh, one of which is we were the first to... Uh, uh, commercially market a bulk laxative, okay? Um, we, we also had uh, the, uh, the first commercially available uh, oral birth control, uh, which when I became a pharmaceutical rep in West Texas was one of the reasons why there was a handful of clinics that would not allow me uh, to actually come into their, to their clinic. Uh, it was viewed in, in, in that way. Uh, but we had a bunch of uh, pretty cool uh, little little things, but we were a street fighting organization. We were a sales organization. It, we, our business model and our culture became uh, go buy the sixth or seventh uh, product to market in a therapeutic area and bludgeon the market with it, beat everybody. We um, purchased a, uh, an NSAID from Wyeth Erst, and which, by the way, was a product of a merger, um, and uh, we bought it for a million dollars, and we ended up doing a million dollars a week uh, with, with the product. But we were a sales organization. And eventually, we were acquired by Monsanto and became a part of the Monsanto uh, family. And then they divested us, and we merged with a group called Pharmacia and Upjohn. Now, Pharmacia and Upjohn uh, was a merger itself of the Pharmacia Corporation, which had a culture in Sweden and the Upjohn Company of Kalamazoo, Michigan, okay? Now, when G Gideon Daniel Searle's sales force 
merged into what was then called PNU, it was a colossal mess. Okay? Now, some of my colleagues that were there at the time would tell you that that was the most exciting time of their, their career. And you know why it was the most exciting time of their career? Because it was pure chaos. There was absolutely no standards of behavior. There was no expectations that were common. In fact, you could actually say that every one of us could do right in, what, in our own eyes. So there was a, quite a bit of liberty, if you will, in, in that organization. Okay? Now, you have three companies coming together, right? You've got Pharmacia, Upjohn, and the Searle Company. You can think of us as three little pigs, all in our little houses, okay? And to uh, kind of rewrite a, a children's fable here, who comes after little pigs? The wolf, known as Pfizer. And so we merged with Pfizer, except for, and I can remember this like it was yesterday, the CEO of Pfizer, a gentleman by the name of Hank McKinnell, in a big ballroom in Marriott in, um, in Orlando, has all of us sitting there in this massive ballroom, and he says, let there be no doubt about what has happened. You have been acquired. The Pfizer culture, the Pfizer standard, is what's going to apply here, okay? And he went to actually institutionalize that because he let us keep our, our Salesforce name, but he took at least two, sometimes three, uh, salespeople from legacy Pfizer divisions and put them in to our sales divisions, okay? Now, you know what they told us, right? This is for diversity of approach. What was that really for? That was... <laughs> Spying is, a, is, a, is an interesting word, probably appropriate. That was to attempt to mandate a way of working, a culture, okay? Um, folks, I can tell you that it worked partially, but it never works fully, okay? Because there's antagonism, and some of our little street fighting ways and uh, countercultural <laughs> Uh, things that we did against the marketing department still kind of prevailed there. And in fact, cost us many, many millions of dollars in fines over the years uh, because we weren't doing things quite the Pfizer way. And then what happens then? A series of layoffs, correct? That's generally what happens. And I got caught up in a layoff in uh, 2009 when we divested about 50% of Pfizer Salesforce, and I go to a company that was known as Sanofi Aventus also a product of merger, quote, acquisition, okay? And I can remember my very first meeting there, guys. It was unlike anything I've ever seen. I walk in at the top of an amphitheater, and I was told by my boss that brought me there, he said, you're going to see a distinct difference. You're going to see immediately who belongs to Aventus and who belongs to Santa Fe. And it was as stark as it could possibly be. I walk in, and on the right-hand side of this amphitheater as I walk in, you have the definition of business casual by Santa Fe, the French company. All the dudes in suits without a tie. That was their definition of business casual. On the left-hand side, you had all the Aventus people, khakis and polo shirts. They looked like, what was it, Jared from State Farm? Okay? Now, because I don't like to wear suits, my affinity was for Jared's. And I kind of migrated to there. But, but folks, it was a holy mess. A holy mess. Um, they didn't like each other. Uh, they started to antagonize each other. And it became a, a, a real struggle as to who was going to get to control the, the, the power structure. Okay? And productivity suffered. The mission of the company suffered. And I think there's some parallels there to what we see in the book of Judges that the land was supposed to be acquired. There was, there is one God, sovereign God. The biggest difference I see is that in the business world, you can actually make a case that some people's approach, all people's approaches are somewhat right. Okay? When it comes to scripture, 
There's only one right, okay? There's only one right that will, should prevail and has already prevailed, okay? So let's, ter- let's turn our attention now to the book of Judges just to, 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 to get things kicked off again. I said we'll be in chapter 3, and we, and we certainly will. Uh, but I'd like to start just by uh, highlighting a couple things out of chapter 2, and I'll start, I believe, in uh, verse 10. It says, That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. We're talking about the, the generation of Joshua. Okay, After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works that he had done for Israel. And then, of course, we know then the sin pattern is described in the, in the following following uh, verses. If I could jump off here for, for just a moment, um, I'd like to uh, throw a couple of quotes at you uh, from two very distinct sides of the political ideological spectrum that both get to the, to, to the same point. Uh, I'll see if you can uh, figure out who actually said these two quotations. Here's the first one. A nation which does not remember what it was yesterday does not know what it is today nor what it is trying to do. We are trying to do a futile thing if we do not know where we came from or what we have been about. You say Reagan? Interesting. It, it's going to be a little, it'll be, it'll be a little earlier than that. Eisenhower. FDR. That is Woodrow Wilson. No way, you say. <laughs> that is Woodrow Wilson. I get why you say no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we, I'm, I'm sure that was somewhat uh, maybe a predecessor to, to his uh, League of Nations uh, situation. Let me give you the second. A nation that forgets its past has no future. That absolutely sounds like something Lincoln, Lincoln would, have, would, have, would have said, and Lincoln has some fantastic quotations that are along that line, but it's actually more contemporary than that, and it's not American. That's Winston Churchill. It says, a nation that forgets its past has no future. Now let me turn to one more quotation, this one from a, um, an author, a secular author, if you will. That men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important of all of the lessons of history. Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World, Brave New World, an English author who would eventually come and live in California, um, experiment uh, in mysticism and LSD, um, and would die on November 22nd, 1963. Brennan? What happened on November 22nd, 1963? The day that Kennedy was assassinated is also the day that Aldous Huxley passed away, and there's another author, another English author, that passed away on that very same day, somebody who comes from a very different approach. A different worldview. Do you know who that was? This is just trivia now. C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis also passed away on that day. I make this point, or attempt to make this point, to say that the um, when you raise up a generation that does not know the culture, the heroes, the meaning, the origin of the past, you're dealing, with, you're dealing with a pretty difficult situation for the present and the future. And you may find some parallels to what's, what's going on today. But let's turn our attention now over to chapter 3. And we're going to start, there's a great place to start in chapter 3. That's verse 1. These are the nations the Lord left in order to test those in Israel who had experienced none of the wars in Canaan. This was to teach the future generations of the Israelites how to fight in battle especially those who had not fought before. These nations included the five rulers of the Philistines, all of the Canaanites, the Sidonians, the Hivites, who lived in the Lebanese mountains from Mount Baal Hermon as as far as the entrance to Hamath. The Lord left them to test Israel, 
to determine if they would keep the Lord's commands he had given their fathers through Moses. But I had an English teacher one time, it might have been my mom, who said whenever you um, use the word but, you erase everything that comes before it. Okay? And um, it says, but, but they settled among the Canaanites, the Hethites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The Israelites took their daughters as wives for themselves, gave their own daughters to their sons, and they worshiped their gods. I see two, two distinct elements in here that are somewhat inter interrelated as to why God left the Canaanite people, the idolatrous people in the promised land, okay? You have to go back to um, um, really verse 2 to see the first one. This was to teach the future generations of the Israelites how to fight in battle. What? How to fight in battle? Does the Lord really want them to know how to fight? Or does he prefer peace? Well, the answer is he prefers peace. But he also realizes in the fallen world that there will not be peace. In fact, David, in the book of Psalms, chapter 18, starting in verse 32, says, God who girds me with strength, strength and makes my way blameless, he makes my feet like hinds feet. He sets me upon high places. That's usually where we stop. Moving on, he says, he trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. That's King David writing in the book of Psalms. In Psalms 100, chapter 144, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues the people under me. Okay? Now, you can, you can look at this in two, two distinct ways. One is to prepare for physical battle, okay? The Lord knows that there's going to be physical battles going on in the promised land. And the reason is they didn't do what they were supposed to do when they first occupied the land. But you can also look at this as a... a a metaphor, if you will, for the spiritual battles that we as Christians fight against the flesh and our own sin nature every single day. That's why a lot of the New Testament um, talks in, in terms of uh, 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 armament and, 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 and battling against them and beating our flesh into submission through, you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? I think, Dad, correct me, I... I, I one of, one of one of your lessons, maybe maybe multiple, talked about what get into the get into the arena or something like that. There's only there's only a reason to get into the arena, and that's because there's a fight going on. There's a fight going on, and there's a fight going on in the promised land. So those people are left in there to do one thing, which is teach the Israelites how to fight. They're going to have to fight. Now you want the great news. Here's the great news, and it comes from the book of Isaiah. Because there's going to come a time where we ain't going to have to fight no more. Okay? And I hope Mom isn't listening to this. He will judge between the nations. He will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. That time is coming, but it ain't now, and it wasn't then. So that's one of the reasons why the people, uh, the idolatrous uh, folks, were left to antagonize uh, the, the Israelites in the Promised Land. Then there's a second one, and this is, this is one that I think we're very familiar with, and that is to test them, to test them. Okay, now, we get a great promise that we're not going to be tested above that which we are able. But how are we able? Not in our own power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit to resist that temptation. Okay? Um, and the last point I'll make about this is a lot of times, and I'm very guilty of this, I see things in 
big generalities. I'm talking about the Israelite people, and you know, and I'm talking about the Hivites and the Perizzites and all the ites, you know, that are going on. But these aren't just countries. These aren't just uh, ancestral uh, groupings. They're individual people. It's individuals that are choosing sovereign God and his law, or they're choosing sin. And I miss that a lot of times, okay? I miss that a lot of times um, because I ascribe the behavior to an entire nation when actually it's merely a collection of individual decisions that are being made. So let's turn our attention now to the very first judge, a fellow by the name of Othniel, starting in verse 7. The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They forgot the Lord their God. They worshipped the Baals and the Asherahs. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he sold them to King Cushan Rishathaim of Aram. And the Israelites served him for eight years. First thing I want you to notice here, this was not happenstance. Okay, this was not just some situation of, of history, some quirk of history. It is God's sovereignty selling the Israelites, his people, into captivity to King Cushan. And if you could actually, if I could actually pronounce that correct, this dude has a really interesting uh, name. Um, let me tell you what, what some, some commentators uh, say. He says, the exact meaning of Cushan Rishathaim is not certain, but the most frequent translations are dark one of double evil, doubly wicked Cushan, Cushan of the double wickedness, Cushan of the double outrage. Get it? <laughs> not a good dude. <laughs> Not a good dude. Uh, but, but he comes from Aram. Does any of your translations say Mesopotamia? Yeah, so you're, 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 and, and that's a good one, okay? Because you don't necessarily, I don't, necessarily think of the promised land of Mesopotamia, right? Mesopotamia, you start thinking of Tigris and Euphrates and, and, and stuff like that. I think that the picture here, though, is really interesting because a king in Mesopotamia is controlling the promised land. Okay, in manner of double wickedness. I think I cannot even talk about this without thinking of the double mint twins, and that and and it's just going through my head, and it's just absolutely tricking me up. Uh, but um, but th this guy's doubly bad. Okay, and from afar he's controlling the 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 the, the promised land here. Okay, but the Lord raises up a deliverer. The Israelites cried out to the Lord. So the Lord raised up Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's youngest brother, as a deliverer to save the Israelites. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He judged Israel. Othniel went out to battle, and the Lord handed, handed over King Cushan of Aram to him so that Othniel overpowered him. Then the land had peace for 40 years, and Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. Okay, so you see your first judge here, Othniel, okay? We actually know about Oth Othniel from the book of uh, Joshua back in, I believe, chapter 15, and then his story that story is actually repeated in the first chapter of the book of Judges. What do we know about Othniel? Uh, he, he, yes, he could either be the grandson of Caleb or he could be the nephew of Caleb. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, so people debate, debate that, okay? Uh, Caleb gave to him his daughter, right, Oxa, you know, in marriage. Why? Why did, why did, why did, he, give, why did he give his daughter to, to, to Othniel? Oth, Othniel led a battle against Debir, and uh, Caleb had actually promised his daughter to, who, to whoever could capture Debir, which was land, uh, land of the giants, okay? And Othniel raised his hand, okay, and says, I'll go do that. And he goes and does that, and he uh, gets Oxa as, as his wife. So we know that about him. So he's a proven warrior. 
on his LinkedIn profile, it says, captured De Beer, okay? Also says, in a relationship uh, with, with Oxa. He's from the tribe of Judah, and that makes sense, okay, right? Who was the first to go up? Judah. Who was the most powerful tribe? Judah, okay? Um, he has an outstanding family background, okay? Caleb is in his lineage, okay? So he got to see the principles of obedience, of trust and faith. He got to see that within his family. Um, but the secret sauce has nothing to do with his lineage. His secret sauce has to do with verse 10 where it says, the spirit of the Lord came on him. He could do nothing without the spirit of the Lord coming upon him. So give him his pedigree if, if you like, but that is the secret sauce to how he becomes the first judge and is able to rout the king of Mesopotamia. We also know that he's a man of action. Okay? There are some commentators who believe that at this point in his life, he's probably around 75 years old. Okay, And he could have stopped at this point, because look at the order. It says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. And my, my translation says, period, right there. Okay, He could have stopped there. Okay, He could have donned the black robes and the powdered wigs. Okay? And just done that. But no, he was called to deliver them. And so the next sentence says, Othniel went out to battle. He went to war. Okay? And did he win that battle? No. After the comment says, the Lord handed over King Cushion. The Lord won that war. Okay? So, but we know he's a man of action. But we also know this. He's still a man. He dies. He dies. Okay? But the land held peace for 40 years. Why don't you think about that in just a moment? Remember, Reagan was mentioned just a few moments ago. Remember when Reagan first burst on the national scene? Well, he was on the national scene even in 1976. But in 1980, yeah, yeah, that's about 40 years. What would you give for the last 40 years, to have been peaceful <laughs> and tranquil. <laughs> okay, that gives you the length of time that now there is peace, okay? There is actually, it's translated the word rest, absence of war, okay? There is a, a time of tranquility in the promised land, but Othniel died. And then we have, what goes throughout Judges repetitively, we have, I call it the Britney Spears concept. And that's probably the only time you're going to hear Britney Spears mentioned in a Baptist Sunday school class. Okay? So what do I mean by that? What was one of her biggest songs, Brennan? Oops, I did it again. I, I take it some of y'all didn't know that. <laughs> um. In verse 12, the Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight. And by the way, thank you, Brennan, for actually getting that one. Much better than, than Douglas MacArthur. Um, he gave King Eglon, and I love that name, second favorite king name to me in the Bible. You know I like King Og. King Og of the Balaam days. I think that's a great king name. But Eglon is not too far behind it. He gave King Eglon of Moab power over Israel because they had done what was evil in the Lord's sight, after Eglon convinced the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join forces with him, there's a merger. He attacked and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites served King Eglon of Moab for 18 years. How long had they been subject to King Cushion? Eight. Eight. Okay. Now they're under the king of Moab and his legions from uh, the Amalekites and the Ammonites for 18 years after 40 years of peace here, okay? What do we know about Moab? What, what, what are those descendants come from? They're the descendants of Lot's incestuous relationship with, with, with his daughter. What about the Ammonites? 
trick question. Same. Different daughter, same other daughter, same situation. What about the Amalekites? What do we know about those, those folks? Okay, they, they're the ones who were constantly battling against Israel during the wilderness wanderings. In fact, they're the, the first ones that they battle um, after the Egyptians, okay? They're constantly pestering them. Uh, 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 they're, they're descendants of uh, Esau's grandson, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody check my math on that one. But they're, they're the wilderness wanderers, okay? They're, they're the nomadic uh, tribe here. And so those three people get together, and Eglon uh, takes them and puts them together, and they defeat Israel uh, because the Lord gave Israel into their hands. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he raised up Ehud, it's a pretty good name too, son of Gera, a left-handed Benjaminite, as a deliverer for them. The Israelites sent him with the tribute for King Eglon of Moab. Okay, so we see the second judge come up here, Ehud, son of Gera. Okay, now it says the Israelites cried out to the Lord. What it's not clear is were they crying out for 18 years, or were they crying out for 18 months? or nine years, doesn't really make it clear here, okay? Nor does it really make it clear if they repented of their sins. It makes it very clear that they cried out in their distress. Um, commentators are a little mixed on this, but the ones I tend to side with would, would, would say it's, it's best not to assume that they actually repented of their sins, okay, and turned away from the idolatrous ways. But they cried out in distress, and they are God's people, and God listens to them and raises up Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed Benjaminite. So he, the first one, Othniel's from Judah. This dude's from the tribe of Benjamin, and he's left-handed, okay? Here's where a lot of this story gets really kind of cool, I think. But before we get there, um, if you look in Latin, okay, do you know what right-handed when you say right-handed, what, what, what root that comes from? From the, from the root dextra, from which we get the term dexterity. Right-handed people were seen as being dexterous, having dexterity, okay? Do you know in Latin what left-handed comes from? Awkward is actually a very close to the French translation, okay? Uh, but, but no, in Latin, it comes from sinistra from which we get the word sinister, okay? And let me tell you, if you have ever played baseball and had to stand in the batter's box and face a left-handed flamethrower, those people are sinister, okay? Particularly one who pitched at Waller High School, which is northwest of Houston, a town that is most noted, I think, for the sign when you entered its city from, the, from, the, from its southeastern side, that says, drive slow, see our city, drive fast, see our jail, okay? And they had a fellow there named Rich Robertson when I was in high school. And that dude plunked me three times in one game. The first time might have been an accident. The next two, probably because of what I said to him after he plunked me the first time. But, um, but this dude is left-handed. But let's not just assume that he's just left-handed because I don't think that really does the, the translation justice. Um, if, you, if you really break this thing down, it, it says that he was bound up on his right side, okay? He was hindered on his right hand. It might be he didn't even have a right hand, or his right hand was deformed or could not function, okay? And so that all he was left with would have been his left hand. It is possible, though, that he could use his, he was left-handed, okay? It is, that is a possibility. We know from Judges chapter 20 that there are a, a, a significant number of uh, sling throwers from the tribe of Benjamin that the Bible says could sling a stone and hit a hair with their left hand, okay? So it is possible that, that he had dexterity in both of his hands, but most of the commentators that, 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 that I read and tend to agree with say that you translate this as he was bound up or hindered or maimed or impaired on his right-hand side. Now, keeping with the theme of baseball, okay? Does anybody remember a pitcher 
for multiple teams, including, the, I believe, the California Angels when they were called that, New York Yankees, um, pitched for the Milwaukee Brewers, among others, named Jim Abbott. Does anybody remember Jim Abbott? Jim Abbott was born without a right hand, okay? And he would, so he obviously pitched left-handed, but he would have to put his glove underneath, you know, his, his, his armpit like this, pitch, quickly change the glove to his left hand, okay, for fielding purposes, and then if they bunted on him, which they tried to do a lot, he'd have to field, take the glove off, get the left hand, and throw the runner out at first base, okay? That's a major league baseball pitcher who pitched 11 years in the major leagues, okay? So that's the way I tend to think of, of this, this dude, Ehud, okay? But in verse 16, and I think a lot of people miss this, Ehud made himself a double-edged sword 18 inches long. He didn't purchase it. He made it. Where do, also, where do we see the, also the term double-edged sword? Yeah, the Word of God, okay? And it's 18 inches long. And this is where we get to the show-and-tell portion of this. Okay. That's how long the sword was, the blade. That's 18 inches. Let's give it another... And by the way, it's your, some of your translations may say cubit, Okay. Um, which actually could be anywhere from 16 to 22 inches. Let's give it another four inches or so for the handle. So the thing is this long. Okay, This is going to come into play here in just a moment. Okay, So he's got himself a double-edged sword. He made it. He strapped it to his right thigh under his clothes and brought tribute to King Eglon of Moab, who was an extremely fat man. <laughs> Some of your translations may have something different, but I think that is about as direct as you get. Okay. Now, in those days, and by the way, up until just a few centuries ago, being fat was a sign of prosperity. This is one of the reasons why I know I was born a few centuries too late. Okay. This is opulence. This is prosperity. This is almost ostentatiousness. It's highborn. Signifies all that. But what it really signifies is flesh. Okay. It signifies the flesh. So when and, and also don't 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 miss this. He brought tribute. He was selected to bring tribute from the Benjaminites to to the king. And so when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he dismissed the people who had carried it. At the carved images near Gilgal, he returned and said, "King Eglon, I have a secret message for you." The king said, "Silence!" And all of his attendants left him. Then Ehud approached him while he was sitting alone in his upstairs room where it was cool. Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And the king stood up from his throne. Let's stop right there for just a moment, okay? Ehud and the, 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 whatever entourage was there had brought their tribute into King Eglon, had given him the money, okay? Now, the way, and, and people, commentators do discuss this, the way I tend to look at this is that now they have left. They have left and the, they're, they're, they're going back. And they get to Gilgal and something clicks in Ehud's mind that he's got to do something. What do we know about Gilgal? Gilgal is where the 12 stones were erected by Joshua after the miraculous crossing of the Jordan. Okay? And by the way, that would have been in the land given to the Benjaminite tribe, the ben tribe of Benjamin. So the way I read this is that maybe he had some second thoughts, wasn't quite sure what he should do, but upon trying to return home, he sees this sacred place and understands what type of idolatry and the adulteriz adulterization of, of God's word is going on and he steals himself to go use the steel, which isn't steel, by the way, but you get the point. Get the dagger that, 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 he, that um, he has strapped to his right side, and he goes back, and he tells Eglon, I got a secret for you, um, but your people are going to have to leave. And he sends his ministers away, and they're, they're up on the roof, actually, is what this uh, is a picture of, where it could catch the breezes here. 
Um, And in verse 21, Ehud reached in with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into Eglon's belly. Even the handle went in after the blade, and Eglon's fat closed over it, so that Ehud did not withdraw the sword from his belly, and waste came out. This is the show-and-tell portion. Does anybody want to come stand sideways? And we'll see just what it would take to put a 22-inch dagger and handle into somebody to where the fat would close over it, okay? My daughter just left. She knew this was coming, okay? Because she would have, we would we, we, it probably would take about five of her, you know, to, to, to figure this out. But, uh, uh, but you're talking about an exceptionally fat dude, and the waste came out, and with it the stench. And Ehud escaped by the way of the porch, closing and locking the doors of the upstairs room behind him. Ehud was gone when Eglon's servants came in. They looked and found the doors of the upstairs room locked and thought he was relieving himself in the cool room, which I think would be a natural assumption. The servants waited until they had become embarrassed and saw that they had still not opened the doors of the upstairs room, so they took the key, opened the doors, and there was their Lord lying dead on the floor. This is an assassin. Ehud, the lefty assassin that kills Hefty, and he's gone. Verse 26, a lot of people just kind of stick with that. I see actually even more interesting stuff than what follows. Ehud escaped while the servants were waiting. He passed the Jordan near the carved images and reached Sarah. When he, and he arrived, he sounded the ram's horn throughout the hill country of Ephraim, which would have been to the north, okay, of where he was. Okay? Um, the Israelites came down with him from the hill country and became their leader. He told them, follow me because the Lord has handed over your enemies, the Moabites, to you. So they followed him, captured the fords of the Jordan, leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all stout and able-bodied men. Not one of them escaped. Moab became subject to Israel that day, and the land had peace for 80 years, had rest for 80 years. What I see here is a picture of of Christian follow-through. It wasn't enough to just, in this case, commit regicide and kill the king. It was not enough, because all they would have done is raised up a prince and continued their domination, okay? Ehud, with tremendous courage, does what he does, escapes, and then goes into the hill country of Ephraim, which is not Benjamin, and he sounds the ram's horn, and the people come down, and they rout the Moabites, okay? They were prepared. They were prepared to do this. Ehud demonstrated leadership here. Can you? And what kind of courage for him to go sound that ram's horn, okay, with all the Moabites and the Amalekites and the Ammonites and all these people around. He sounds the ram horn, and people came down. Think about this. He sounds the ram horn, and nobody comes. And he's looking around, and he just realizes, I sounded the ram horn and told everybody where I am, and there's nobody coming here. Okay, nobody coming, but that's not what happened. There had to be some preparation, and the people had to have been prepared to hear the ram's horn and know that it's time to get into action. Okay, and that's exactly what they did. Now, do you know where Eglon actually set up his set up his shop? It says the city of Palms, does it not? Isn't that what it says? Does it say in the city of Palms? Do you know what that city is? That's Jericho. Think about how awful that must have felt to the Israelites. The first big city, military fortress that they capture, okay, and now it has fallen into the hands of King Eglon of Moab. He's reestablished, okay, a reign there in Jericho. And they take it back. And they cut off the retreat, okay? I think that's a really, really cool story. Um, next week, we will look at actually one of my favorite, only double-mentioned uh, uh, individuals in Scripture, that Shamgar, 
who I also can't talk about with thinking of Sham Wow commercials, but Shamgar, we'll start with Shamgar, and then we'll get into Deborah and Barack. Any questions um, on this? Any comments? Okay. Yeah, it gets one verse here, but it's rich. It's... It, Well, I think one of the cool things is Ehud was handicapped in some way, and he's used. He's used of God. And a lot of times, God uses that, that our handicaps. I mean, Paul says he has a thorn in the flesh, right? Yep. Don't worry about it. I got you. I got you, okay? So whatever you think is handicap, ha- handicapping you, I'm too shy or whatever, okay? You can still be used of God. He wants to use you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's 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 something that is also taught, and it's taught op- actually in, in, in opposite ways sometimes. That he would have had if he was a left handed person, he would have had his the sword in his left hand side, like you would if you were, you know, gonna you know, be in a, in, you know, at high noon, you know, quick, quick draw. Uh, but then others say, no, they would have probably been a cross draw. And some people actually go as far as to talk about the way the dress of the day was, uh, the wrap that would have been on, would have, been, would have exposed it had it been on the left side, not the right side. But no doubt, they're not going to let, they're not going to let somebody in to see the king without having done some search. But, you know, if you also go in and you, you see this, this guy who, really only has one functioning hand what kind of threat is he gonna is he gonna pose okay um but uh interesting interesting stuff anything else <laughs> that's exactly right there's some irony there the the word benjamin means son of my right hand and a who's left-handed <laughs> and they have left-handed uh slingers <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah Great sense of humor. I wonder what means son of my left hand. I don't, I don't know. I wanted so badly for my son to be left-handed so that he could be a sinister pitcher. Uh, but we tried to bind up his right hand at one point, say, no, don't use that. We have a left-handed miniature Bernadoodle right now. He'll shake hands only with his left hand. So if you ever meet Louie, he's going to shake your hand left-handed. So close as we got. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these stories uh, that, that you provide us, Lord, but... We thank you not because of the, the, the stories themselves, but because they, they point to a need for a Savior, for a Deliverer, Lord. Uh, may, may we always be mindful of that. May we be mindful of the sin in our lives that separates us from fellowship with you and loose the Holy Spirit in our lives, convict us of that, and to bring us into the right relationship and restore that relationship with you so that we might be used for your kingdom. We pray a special blessing on the service that will follow and both the music and the message that is brought, that it might encourage us, lift us up, uh, to be soldiers for you here on earth. It's in Christ's name we pray.